Before we get into our lesson of the afternoon, I certainly hope all of you will with me rejoice and be thankful that the Spanish brethren have had such a fine lectureship. It's good to see the parking lot overflowing and to have all of the good things that I hear happening and uh, to have the problems that are caused by things like that. I don't know what we would do. I don't guess we would have the same viewpoint if this building were filled to overflowing with our crowd. I don't think we would uh, be all out of sorts over that. I think we'd be very, very thankful, and I'm thankful for them. Eric didn't realize what he said as far as introducing my sermon but he thanked God that we would not have to cross Jordan, meaning dying, alone. Being alone is something that sometimes you raise a bunch of kids and sometimes just to get out of the rat race, you feel kind of good to be alone. But that's not the kind of loneliness that I'm thinking about. There are 6.5 or maybe more than that billion people on this earth today. You might say, how could anybody ever think that they would be alone out of 6.5 billion people and growing daily? But I promise you, every one of us have at times felt alone. Now, raise this question. What causes this? What causes in our minds to have this feeling or emotion of being alone? Well, it can be disagreements. Maybe some disagreements are worthwhile. Maybe they're not, but they turn out into making us feel like we're alone. And one of the greatest on this earth among men to make a person truly feel alone is death. I participated in a multiplicity of, of funerals over almost 60 years of preaching. I've seen various happenings at funerals, but one of the greatest things is to see people who now know that they're not going to see that person anymore. That's over and done with as far as this world's concerned, yet they've been a part of their lives for years and years and years, the most intimate part of it. And so that can cause people to feel alone because they are as far as that person is concerned. There can be all kinds of disappointments. Every one of us have been disappointed in somebody else and probably we've been disappointed in ourselves at times. And people, if, and we work with people, that's what we do. If you're a Christian, you're involved with people. You're concerned about people being lost. You want them to be saved by Jesus Christ. You want them to know the way of salvation. And yet so many times those same people who need to be saved will disappoint you in the way they receive the truth. I think of Stephen. The very people he was preaching to was of his own background, Grecian Jews. And he had to love them to preach the truth to them, yet the very people he loved the most killed him, rejected him. Then there are those who will seem to be somewhat, maybe they have been for a while, people who are Christians and are faithful, but then they depart from the faith, or maybe a family member leaves the truth and departs, and you can't be with them as you once were. There can be all kinds of personal struggles. We all have them that we are seeking constantly to bring our minds and our lives, therefore, into subjection to Jesus Christ. That's the challenge the Christian faces always is to think like Christ, speak like Christ, act like Christ. And then there can be those situations that seem to overcome us. So we're not, a, we're not alone in those things that make us feel alone because what I've just mentioned to you today is a common lot of all humans to one extent or the other, to one degree or the other. 
But I would ask you to think about this. Who created us as we are? Human beings. Well, God did. Therefore, he is the architect of the human mind. And he has insights that we can't have without aid of his revelation to help us overcome loneliness of being alone, of the kind of loneliness that is haunting. So from time to time, we will be mindful of those who are lonely and the church here where I've been has tried to say, well, try to go visit the widows. Sometimes all you can do with them, they don't necessarily need anything financially, but they're by themselves. Maybe their family lives quite a ways from them. Or maybe they have no family. Part of our being Christians, being of Christ, being brothers and sisters in the family of God is to encourage lonely people. And that brings us down to fellowship in the church. Of course, if we fellowship other people as the Bible teaches we should fellowship our brethren, then we do that because they're faithful to the same God we are. Because first of all, we must be reconciled to God. Because as we stand before God as sinners, we are separated from God. We don't have God. We're alone as far as God is concerned. But Christ came to reconcile man who left God. God didn't leave man. To reconcile mankind to God. First in making a way where their sins can be forgiven, where they can be justified in God's sight. And thus the plan of salvation in the great gospel message. The gospel is God's power to save us from sin. Romans 1.16 is taken care of. Our past sins can be completely forgiven. God is the one we've offended, so he does the forgiving. Where does the forgiving take place? In the mind of God Almighty. On the basis of our acceptance from the heart, the very way one is saved by God. In belief in Christ who is the way, the truth, and the life. Repentance of sins, confession of faith in Christ. And then notice how you get into Christ. You're baptized into Christ, Galatians 3 and verse 27. To obtain the remission of your sins, Acts 2 verse 38. And from that point forward, if a person genuinely stays faithful, he's reconciled to God. And as far as ever being truly alone, he's not alone anymore. Wherever he is, there's his God. There have been a few times over the years in traveling that I found myself pretty much outside of everything I was familiar with. And a few, most of the time I'm traveling with people so that I was uh, used to. But I found out in my travels sometimes you can be with a whole host of people and feel pretty alone when you don't see anybody around you that you know. You're outside your culture. They're speaking a language you can't understand. And there have been a few times where I wasn't sure quite where I was going at times and even where I was. But I always will remember that I was no farther away from God in those cases as I am right now. God is everywhere. And my faith in God was not lessened because I was not in familiar surroundings or with people I could converse with because God is with me. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. And he anoints my head with oil. My cup runneth over. And as David said, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You can't escape that if you love the Lord, keep his commandments. He's always there. His promise to the apostles, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. You're never really alone when you're truly a faithful child of God. But God has even seen, seen fit to give us strength that comes from our brethren of like precious faith. 
Because everybody that's a Christian all became a Christian the same way, one at a time, believing the same gospel and obeying it. They serve God in the same way, by obeying the same Savior, following what he says we do in worship and in our daily conduct. And thus you find so much in the New Testament talking about the fellowship between brethren, loving the brethren, and how much we should do to encourage one another, and strengthen one another, lean upon one another. And many of our songs, of course, are designed to encourage. When I feel alone, there are scriptures. I'm talking about a loneliness. There are scriptures that are meant to encourage me. I felt like at times, and I mean feelings, that came from my knowledge of given situations, that there was nobody to do certain things but me if it was going to get done. And I primarily think of that as a preacher of the gospel. Other preachers I know felt the same way. In other words, you have a responsibility to fulfill that only you can do. It doesn't mean others don't have some responsibilities. That's not the point. The point is, you're there. And it's your job. And it's your duty. And though nobody else does it, it's your responsibility, whether anybody else does or doesn't do it, to do what is your duty. And there's times you can feel rather alone. And I think when you go to 1 Kings chapter 19, that you can see the great prophet Elijah. And how, how great we look at Elijah. What a stalwart man he was for the truth and how he stood in the face of terrible adversity. Notice what he said when he was at the bottom of his loneliness in 1 Kings 19, verse 10. And he said, this is God questioning and his answer, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. You will see depression, and I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. Well, the Lord's response to him should encourage us all. That's the way he viewed, he, he viewed it. He, great, faithful servant of God. And yet, he was, to <laughs> say the least, down in the dumps. He said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountain and break it in pieces, the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering end of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And there's times as a preacher of the gospel of Christ or as Christians having to deal with various things, there's a time to be down on your knees and pouring your heart out to God. There's times when there's an end to being on your knees and you rise up and you fight the fight of faith. He repeats himself here in verse 14, what I read earlier, to God. And of course, when you come on down, God tells him it's not nearly as bad as you think it is, though it is very bad. Look in verse 18. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. And immediately after that, you have this statement said of him, So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat. Well, what kind of a man's Elisha? He's the man upon whom the mantle of Elijah would fall and pick up and carry on when God took Elijah into heaven in that flaming chariot. We would do well to remember these were not written to take up space and to tell a story like Star Wars or something like that. They're in for our learning. To know that things can look at their bleakest 
But there were 7,000 here. He says, I'm the only one left. They're trying to kill me. But there's 7,000. They're still faithful to me. So we can feel isolated at times. That's part of it. Yeah, I, pre- I promise you, if Elijah felt isolated, we surely can. And all you have to do, and I will not go through that, is read Paul's writings of all the persecutions that came upon him. I don't know how the apostles stood what they stood, except that God did give them the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit to have strength beyond human strength, to persevere, to do the work that God had called him to do. You remember all of what persecutions he'd been under? How they'd been pressed down? But they were not destroyed. Paul said, I've learned in whatsoever state I'm in to be content. That's a thing greatly to learn that many people in this life never learn. There's so little contentment in this life. But it's part of Christianity. It's part of the Christian's character. It's part of what you must develop, and you must do it. Just like Elijah had to get up and go, change his mind and act. When I feel alone, I think I need to learn a lesson that we might say can be learned from nature. Going over to Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. Sometimes we don't see that this from this standpoint, but, but it's talking about what we're talking about. Jesus speaking in what we know as the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? A lot of people don't know that. A lot of people really don't know that life is more than what we eat and our sustenance and our physical needs and our clothing and our shelter. They don't know that. But Jesus asked the rhetorical question, yes, far more than that. Then he tells us something about his creation and refers to the birds. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. And then look like he makes them think. Are ye not much better than they? When have you ever seen a worried bird? Let me ask you that. You don't. You ever seen a worried cat? You ever seen a worried any animal? I'm not saying you haven't seen some sick or hurt or whatever else, but I'm talking about the way human beings worry. Brood. I like what I heard of one time making a point. This man said, you have a brooder for a husband, and that's what brooders brood. That's what they do. They brood. Well, if you can recognize that, you can do something about it. Doesn't mean you'll ever get completely over it, but you can do something about it. And God hasn't given us anything for us to do to be faithful and to have happiness here and rejoice, but that we can't do something about it. We focus too much on material needs. I've noticed this all my life in the church. You can't tell much difference in members of the church and those in the world. They're concerned about the same things. What we have in this life is all going to be burned up someday. The underlying principle is that God cares for you and He watches after you and you put Him first and love Him with all your heart and keep His commandments Now, here's where your belief comes into question. Do you really think he'll take care of you? We don't understand Matthew 6, 33. I know 10 how many times been quoted from this pulpit and in classrooms, and you've read it, and you've heard it said, and you may have quoted it, but do you really understand it? Seek ye first. People don't do that. What does it mean if I have two places to go, one to get the Lord's work done and one to do what I please, and I really like what I'm doing? Which comes first? What do I neglect? What do I put off? Well, it doesn't take long to look around and see what people put off. When you think of Hagar, and it's a pitiful account of Hagar, Sarah, 
Abraham's wife's bond servant. You read about her, and you cannot hardly but shed a tear when you think about all that came upon her. Genesis 16, verses 13 and 14. She's been sent away. God told Abram, because that Isaac and thy seed, thy seed shall be called. So do what Sarah said and send her away. And that meant Ishmael goes too. Let me read to you Genesis 16 and verse 13. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Wherefore the well was called Beer la Hiroi. Behold, it is between Kadesh and and uh, Bered. And you keep that in mind, because when you see her, she has been doing whatever she was supposed to do. But then she's cast out. She's alone. She puts her son down over here because she can't stand to watch him die. What happened? God forget her. God paid no attention to her. God didn't care. No, he showed her the way when it came to waters concerned. And notice how it goes back up earlier. When she finds the way, it's because God says, I'll take care of you. The water is supplied. Tells I'll make of Ishmael a great nation. And he did. But it's still a pitiful thing. Can you say any of that is Hagar's fault? No. And God took care of her. Let me show you how many times we um, think about this when it comes to the songs we sing and worship to God and in speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. When you feel alone, we can learn great scriptural lessons and find great strength from songs. Be with me, Lord. Do you know my Jesus? Does Jesus care in heavenly love abiding? There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. And what a friend we have in Jesus. And the great physician nigh near the sympathizing Jesus. He bids the drooping heart to cheer. Oh, hear the voice of Jesus. Why are those songs there? Who wrote those? Because people feel alone. They need encouragement. And then when you look at Mark 14, 50, he just simply says, Christ didn't have a friend with him. All his friends forsook him. But when you come over to the writer of Hebrews, writing to encourage Christians to be in faithful, in Hebrews 13 and verse 5, notice, let your conversation, your manner of life, your conduct, be without covetousness, and then look what he says. And be content with such things as ye have. Why? Tells us. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. And thus the prayer I won't have, after a song actually, I won't have to cross Jordan alone. And then he says in verse 6, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. We need to realize that all these billions of people, and even in a congregation that's smaller, a congregation that's large, you can, you can feel alone. And just taking time to Say hello. 
How are you doing today? Good to see you out. We heard this about, we're so happy for you. You know, we are taught to rejoice with them that rejoice. And rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Jesus knows and Jesus cares. And if nobody else truly didn't care, Jesus knows and Jesus cares. You need the kind of faith we talked about this morning in God and Christ and His good word. You may never figure it out. I quit trying a long time ago. How He works everything out. Here's what I, I'm concerned about. I have been for a long, long time. My part in the matter. To build my faith up. To put my trust in God based on His word. And then we'll come and close the lesson by simply reminding you of somebody else that stood alone and was ridiculed. Again, written in the Old Testament. And we'll let it go with this because I've used it so many times before. How many people stood with only a little boy David? <laughs> only a babbling brook. Only a little boy David. Five little stones he took. One little stone went into the sling. The sling went round and round. One little stone went up, up, up. And what happened? The giant came tumbling down. And the giant of loneliness will collapse before you every time when you put your faith in God and Christ and the Christian system and to know that he truly is with us. And our brethren who are true Christians and faithful are always there to help and to strengthen. But if they're not, God is. And thus we come to the end of our way. And you won't have to cross Jordan alone. I'll, I want to mention this in, in also closing. When Lazarus died, he represents people who die faithful to the Lord, and he goes into paradise in Abraham's bosom. I pointed this out before, but not crossing Jordan alone, he had an escort of angels. They escorted him. So the moment your spirit leaves this body, I see no reason to think that all of God's children, for what children even mean to us, our own, how much more so God's children to him. Blessed are the dead that die in the Lord. Yea, from henceforth they rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And thus I can expect, I think, exactly what happened with Lazarus. There's a band of angels awaiting to escort the faithful into the very paradise where Abraham is and Paul is and James and Peter and Abraham and all those worthies we read about so long. If we will but trust in him with the trust that leads us to obey him no matter what he asks of us. If you need to obey the gospel, would you do that this afternoon in view of all God's done for you? He will be with you always if you will stay faithful to Him. If you've sinned, will you repent of those sins and confess them as a child of God you've wandered? Will you do that? We'll pray with you and for you. And God will hear and God will forgive because that's what He wants to do. All His Son went through is to make it where He could forgive. So we invite you to come to Him while we stand and sing.